Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody and all. Uh, I, first, Hamid Abshar, cardiac electrophysiologist uh, with Baylor at VA. Um, I would like to thank the executive committee and organizer of the meeting uh, for invitation. It is my really privilege uh, and honor to be here, especially regarding Dr. Masumi, which I was trained with him. It's always uh, great uh, to be here. So this, uh, the topic is, uh, which is uh, now, nowadays really, is a lot of conversation about this thing, cardiac contractility modulation. Um, so I always like to start the case with uh, one of my patients, uh, make it more scenario, then I try to be interactive and ask questions, see what you feel. So this is my typical patient at VA. Um, we have all of the above, you know, ischemic cardiomyopathy, cabbage, AFI flutter, ablation, um, all the risk factors. The problem is uh, he, he already has a defibrillator and ablation was done, but he keep coming to the hospital because of the compensation, heart failure decompensation. It multiple time over the one year he came. And he's really literally on the good medication. I really give a lot of credit to uh, changes in the medication, guideline-directed medical therapy, which include the, you know, sucopetril and Marsartan diuretic, uh, anticoagulation, uh, lipid. So it is very typical. And I just like to get your opinion. So what do we do? And this is his EKG. Really nothing impressive. Nothing. Normal sinus rhythm, tight QRS. And what do I what do I offer this patient if next time come to the hospital? Do I have anything to offer? So we did echo typical 25 to 30 percent and great uh, three diastolic dysfunction. Um, and moderate, uh, mild to moderate, and um, pulmonary hypertension. No, I'm going back, sorry. And uh, so also, we did the catheterization. Nothing really, everything total uh, CTO of the, all the vessel and jump uh, LAD uh, graft is open. So what do we do here? Really, it is a big issue, yes, sir. Huh? Yeah. Uh, what really uh, do it is a big issue. It is uh, it is huge. Uh, we have uh, um, sixty million worldwide, and then um, in U.S. Uh, we have six million, and it is a horrible situation. Being a heart failure patient, it is not maybe worse than cancer because there is no quality of life. There is no quality of life, and it is big. One out of five in the lifetime, they have CHF. And it's not benign. It is 50% they die after five years, which is, I think that's the reason I said it is, it's a real issue. Now, what do we do? It is, uh, as you see, it's a typical um, patient uh, quality of life. It's not only the length of the life is shortened, that length also is very horrible situation. They can't do anything. They can't go to pick up the mail. They cannot do or the routine thing. And that uh, made it CRT showed that this hospitalization, it's not just, okay, increase the diuretic, discharge them. Next time, another trip to the hospital, adjust the medication discharge. These people, they have eightfold, when they hit the ER, they have eightfold increase in the mortality. That's huge. And they have the same level recurrent admission to the hospital. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, we're doing this practice, we see the people, they, they compensated, they come, okay, 
adjust the medication, EKG is good, not AFI, what to do in medication adjustment. Do we have anything else to offer? As I said, tight QRS. I am a believer of CRT and I've done a lot of CRT and I've seen results, but that's not a reality. That is, uh, um, as you see, there is uh, really increased mortality and then the poor quality of life. We cannot, you say, when they hit the ER, we're going to be reacting. I want to see this difference. We don't want to be reactive. We want to uh, prevent it before, before they hit the ER. Because as you see, the, the thing going down, you know, one first admission, that is going down. You know, the onset of CHF, then we, uh, for a phase, we have a plateau. We start the medication, the, okay, SGLT2 inhibitor, MRA, all of those good medication. We make them stable, but that is another ER visit, another. And we just said is eight times increased mortality every ER visit. So how about we, we do something? To, what do we have? And okay, at the end of the care, we have, okay, LVAD, we have heart transplant, but it is less than 0.1% of this population have an opportunity to give LVAD and heart transplant. How about in between? What do we do in between? There is a big gap. What do we do in between? Uh, I wish we could do more CRT, but reality is CRT, what we look at the data, only 30% of people, they, by the criteria, they are indication for CRT, 30% of this population. How about the other 70%? As you said, um, of this patient, as you see, the, by criteria, they need to, to have left bundle, QRS wide, EF low, and then the, beyond it. But this is not answering the whole population we're dealing. And uh, that we have uh, those uh, people that still, we put a CRT by criteria, still they can be 30% non-responder. Now let's go back. What we go, actually for the first time, I have to give it to Dr. Keru. Uh, we were talking about this thing years ago that uh, he was uh, uh, talking to me about uh, this uh, CCM. And then I got more engaged and we have been doing it. The, this goes back to long journey, 1960. Dr. Wood, everybody knows Dr. Wood. He is actually the researcher and physiologist at Mayo Clinic, Rochester. And if you do the uh, you know, pulmonary resistance, Wood, we said two unit Wood, that's him, Air Wood. So he confirmed that this action potential is important. Action potential, Duration and strength, it's determined the contraction of the muscle, contracting forces. This is back in 60. So 50, 60 years after, reach to the, this uh, FDA approval that March 2019, FDA approved this mod modality, which is a new modality for uh, treating the uh, heart failure, hospital uh, patient with heart failure, which we called it cardiac contractility modulation. And a few months later, the two lead system approved. And this is traditionally, they called it optimizer smart, which is uh, made by impulse dump dynamic. What is this? It's a pacemaker. It's a pacemaker. Traditionally, I just, because the, the how we implant, traditionally we put it on the right side. Why? Because many people, they have already defibrillator on the left side. Or maybe they need a defibrillator in future. So preferentially, we use the right axis. It has two lead. It has a generator, impl uh, implantable pulse generator, and two RV lead. 
any lead we can utilize, any pacing lead. Uh, and uh, this is, we put it on the, so one thing I want to say, we put it on the septum. Two points why it is on the septum. Because the septum sharing to be the left ventricle, RV with left ventricle. Second, this output of this device is 400 times more than pacemaker. 400 times more than pacemaker, the output is 7.5 volt at 20 milliseconds. And that, if you put it on a lateral wall, it can catch the nerve and cause extra cardiac stimulation. So that is two points that, why we do this thing on the septum. And uh, uh, truly, and this work really, it improved contractility without increasing the oxygen demand. And like, in a sense, is a beta blocker. It works like a beta blocker because it act, activates the parasympathetic. I go through the mechanism. So where it does, obviously, this is a huge impulse. 400 times, then the duration is a biphasic, 7.5 volt, and uh, it hit the action, absolute refractory period of uh, heart which is not excitatory. So it, can, it doesn't matter. You hit it at that time. It does not cause contraction. It does not cause any action potential. So that is a window. We're thinking at the end of the QRS, at the top of the QRS, 40 millisecond, which is the, the time interval, which is no matter how strong you pace, it's not going to be uh, depolarizing. And the way it does, it is different mechanism. It does, I go through it, but it is really so delivering the impulse to the septum. And by this thing, you know, increasing the contraction of that muscle, regional muscle, it activates mechanoreceptor. And by this activation through the vagal, we decrease the sympathetic tone. So it is in favor of parasympathetic, this action, to, to withdraw some sympathetic activity. And obviously, there are other effects that long term we're going to do. Then, so after the moment you put a pacemaker, it starts working because we check it, make sure that it is delivering the energy. This Now, a lot of patients, a technical aspect, we have to be two centimeter. Let me go back. With this two lead, we need at least two centimeter distance between the two lead on the septum. And if they have a defibrillator, we need to be two centimeter away from the defibrillator. Usually, many of them, they have a defibrillator. So we have to consider that uh, distance between the lead and between the lead and existing defibrillator or something. And when I implant, I put a maximum output on this, and I ask the device company to make the maximum sensitivity of the device to see if interaction, device-device interaction. So that is a technical for the implantation. Now, the moment we put, this is a study of the day, they did gene expression from biopsy. So all the good uh, gene, which is circa, uh, uh, sarcoplasmic endoreticulum, which is a very major enzyme in this contraction, they're all, they were down-regulated. So we see improvement after three months, they upgraded, then phospholampone, PLB, phospholampone, rhinidine, they go. And then on the other side, we see down, uh, you know, the whatever was downgrade, uh, upgraded uh, the, the improvement and decreasing that thing, which is A and P, B and P. These are the thing uh, that, and the same, they did a, um, this uh, three months follow up, echo by angiography, and they saw that reversal modeling after three months, which is, uh, 
decreasing in the volume and systolic volume and diastolic volume and uh, improving 5% ejection fraction. So when we put the CCM, it's at the active rapid, which is the from the moment you implant to hours, which is very local. It really I, I, is a concept of calcium. So the, the very crucial thing is calcium, role of calcium handling and this environment that causing all of this problem. Because uh, at the time when contraction happened, calcium stay into the cytoplasm. And for the next contraction, we need to have this calcium transfer to the sarcoplasmic. But because of this circa, which is inhibited by phospholambdan, this cannot do that action. So actually it makes sense. Now they are coming with, so it's both systolic and diastolic dysfunction because calcium stay in the cytoplasm. So that's the reason they are coming with these devices coming for diastolic dysfunction. They have the higher, get aim higher, which is the normal ejection fraction with diastolic dysfunction, which we don't have anything. So that is something that try to normalize the calcium handling. Systolic for the low ejection fraction and diastolic because it's a state there. So that the action is to postvolumdan become active and transfer the calcium to the sarcoplasmic. So the study become lysotropy, loser, and then also we have calcium for the next contraction. So that is the pathophysiology, how it works in locally. So, and then after hours, two weeks, we have that uh, talk about the gene expression, which is uh, happened, and then, uh, then all of this reversal caused reverse remodeling months. That how did they get there? There are multiple study, heart failure, fixed heart failure, four European, then we have five uh, feasibility in US with a limited number, 50 patient. Then we have the fixed HF5, which is uh, 428 patient randomized for this thing. And obviously here, what they said is a quality, they put all of this FDA approved, there was no mortality at that time. Quality of life, six minute tall walk, and uh, like a, uh, that, that was an end point for that. And then uh, if there is any complication related to device. And after that, then we have this, uh, after, that randomized trial in US, then they look at it. Who are the people benefiting of this? The, the steepest slope is between 25 to uh, 45. Those are, and it makes sense. If it is really literally below 25%, maybe it is the burn out, a lot of a scar, and it's really, Physiology doesn't play that much role there anymore to release the calcium. So that was the, the 25 to 45%, uh, which is approved. And then uh, now, obviously, it, it was not based on the mortality, but the drive of this difference is hospitalization. As you see, the control group hospitalization in the red and then, but it makes sense. The, it was not designed, it was for quality of life. But we just said that any hospitalization, it increased mortality. So it makes sense to think about the changing in mortality also. And this is a thing, it is a 2019 and this is a, Timeline for, C and remember CRT also, it came uh, like Miracle, ICD, Companion, and until we get to the AHA, ACC uh, for this uh, uh, CRT implantation, it takes time. And this just started in 2019. And they, so potentially it has more room 
for more indication. And also, as I said, there are there are the pipeline, they are thinking about this pacemaker with defibrillator combination, Integra D, which hopefully we get as a part of it. Integra D, they they do the CCM plus the defibrillator. And the other one is aim higher, which is looking for diastolic dysfunction and see the role of this on that. So based on that, uh, in EF of 25, so if less than, it, what do we do with 45% to 35%? What do we do? Really? Not much. We can do medication, of course, I mean, medication, but now I'm talking about device-wise. That, that gap, we just, we don't have anything to offer. I mean, although there are some thing for heart failure, this CVRX or barrel steam is coming, which we are part of a two barrel steam. But, uh, but at least something that, uh, uh, and uh, we have to, is capable to delivering something that help a patient. And I think that's, that is something we are on the same thing for the heart failure, moderate to reduced uh, group. Uh, it can be something to add to our, uh, who, who does it? Anybody in plant device can do it. Who does it? Uh, who is engaged? Obviously, heart failure, physician, everybody. And our referral is coming from heart failure to uh, implantation is like a pacemaker. Implanting on the right side is really just a, some practical point, but really it's not that different. Uh, and as I said, there are uh, potential for utilization of this technology in combination with the defibrillator and also the, for diastolic dysfunction. So basically, if we have CRT indication still, I'm a very fan of CRT to implant the CRT. Although it is changing with this thing, you know, CRT versus uh, 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 conduction system pacing, uh, which is, again, is a, uh, something that is going, is exciting. Pacemaker was not really exciting a couple of years ago. We just all put, put a pacemaker, literally dual chamber, everybody. Then we have this thing happening, you know, conduction system pacing, lidless pacemaker, which we are implanting in atrium now. Those are the thing is really making it a more flavor for the pacing compared to what it was two, three years ago. We have more option now. So if anybody less than 35, obviously white QRS, still CRT or uh, conduction system pacing, and um, if it is, I have a patient, it's not, it's like 40%, and he come to the hospital, I implanted the CCM. Because he doesn't want to come to hospital. He doesn't have any quality. So those are the things that at least we can think about. Now back to my patient, this is the one that I did, that you saw the EKG and uh, um, so on the left side, he has a, uh, dual chamber ICD, uh, Boston Scientific, I implanted. And on the right side, I put the CCM. And as you see, on the septum, two lead on the septum, we try to manage that uh, distance between the two lead, two, uh, two centimeter, and then between the lead and the defibrillator. And uh, so that is the, LAO view. Now, how does it work? Actually, the technology, I like it. It's a, uh, in, in Europe, is seven hours, but in the US, five hours of uh, delivering this uh, per 24 hours. So it, is, uh, it, it has a gap of 3.8 hours in between. So five hours delivery of the energy of the pacing and uh, um, in between, uh, just um, separated by the rest period. And uh, that's interesting, one hour charging. This is the technology that you can charge the battery. And it lasts 
forever, 15 years more than that. So they have a charger, as you see in the middle one is a charger and uh, uh, the patient can do the charging. We, we can put, we have one in the hospital if they forgot to bring, you know, the patient. So the charger and then pulsing uh, generator and uh, programmer. Now this is a patient, the same patient we did. <clears throat> Look at the heart logic. I, you know, heart logic is a very five different and uh, think they look at it, you know, heart rate, S3, you know, the sleep, hours, this, that. It's a good combination. We call it heart logic. Actually, we, we have been uh, with heart failure. We're monitoring the heart logic. So this uh, patient actually, as, after implant, you see that heart logic really dropped. And uh, it shows that uh, uh, by those criteria, um, that utilize for heart failure. So the goal thing is, uh, you know, I, I, I think as I said, uh, it is a simple procedure. It is not complicated, need anything, you know, anybody implant device, it can put it. And uh, it's something maybe fit for some patient that they have, uh, they can benefit from that. And um, I think this is it for me. <laughs>